Hello there. My name's Harold Wilderson, and I'd like to talk today uh, about the fact that I love to tell the story. And uh, this came to me uh, to use this title uh, for what I have to say today. Uh, it was July 4th, 2023, and I was watching TV, and uh, I like Southern gospel music, and I was watching Bill Gaither's uh, program. Uh, it was Black History Month, and he had on a number of my favorite singers. One of them was Andre Crouch that he had on there that day. And uh, as he was singing, I went back in time to a concert at Messiah College, the Eisenhower Center. My sister Faye and I were there to hear our dear brother Andre sing some of the greatest songs ever written. Some of them are in your hymnal at your church. Uh, he's written some wonderful songs. And it was there at that concert that my dear brother Andre Crouch um, ushered my dear sweet Karen into my life. And um, what happened was uh, my sister and I heard that he was gonna be at Messiah so we made plans to go. We were there, the concert was over, and here came this Karen. Never met her before. She's my almost next door neighbor. She lived, I live in Chambersburg. She lived in Scotland, Pennsylvania. Uh, she come running up to my sister Faye. They were good friends. They worked together at, at uh, a nursing, local nursing home. And so they knew each other and, and they were so happy to see each other. And then my sister Faye introduced me to my Karen. And uh, we uh, gradually fell in love and got married and lived happily after all the time, sometimes. I'll put it that way. We had our ups and downs over the years. Next month, it'll be 47 years that we've been doing uh, life together. Um, and yes, he's gone now. Andre Crouch is gone, but his life and music live on in our hearts. He planted seeds of God's love, grace, and mercy into our hearts that germinated. And there's an exponential growth going on in the kingdom from the seeds that Andre planted. And uh, during the concert, uh, Bill Gaither's wife, Gloria, came on and she mentioned the fact that her favorite song is, I love to tell the story. And that related to me because I love a good story and I love to tell the best story in the world, the story of Jesus and all that he's done for us. And if we'll just accept him as our savior, we can live forever. She went on to talk about um, the verse, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And Gloria said, if you don't learn it, it won't be there when you need it. And I'm here today to tell you some of my story and I hope it will bless your heart. I wanna start um, It was 1957. I was in first grade and I remember my daddy at breakfast time, we'd get the old Bible down and, and, and he'd read a portion of scripture to us. My three sisters, Edna, Ada, and Faye, and I would sit and listen as Daddy would read God's holy word. He'd put the Bible down and we'd listen as he would pray over us. I remember Daddy praying to God to help us all. Mother, Edna, Ada, little Harold, Faye, and Daddy himself to live our lives as wise as serpents and harmless as doves. I heard him pray that, pray that prayer many times. He prayed many truths during his time of prayer that shaped our lives for years to come. It was during that time that I left, I felt, it was during that time that I felt this tug on my heart. It was Jesus speaking to me as he has spoken to me for many years since and I've learned to know his voice. Yes, that voice that has brought me comfort, 
joy and peace and love beyond description. It was that love tugging at my little heart that was convicting me of my sins and I resisted for about three years. During revival meetings, when the invitation was given, I wanted to say yes to Jesus, but I just couldn't do it. I was scared. I was scared to do what I had to do to receive Jesus into my heart. I know how I would have done things differently back then if I had only known then what I know now. Oh, the pain that I suffered during that time as I became rebellious. Big time rebellion was in my heart. I got to the point where I resisted my mother's instructions and I would sass her to the point of, to, I'm, to the point of bringing her to tears. It got so bad one day that mother, in tears, told me, Harold, one more time. I remember like it was five minutes ago. One more time, and you are going to get it. I didn't think that warning, uh, it didn't mean that much to me, and I didn't think uh, I had to listen. So uh, I don't think that warning last, lasted more than five minutes. I was pushing her to the limit. It was only minutes after the warning that I, Harold Wilderson, laid into my mother with a vengeance. It broke her heart. Then with all the love my mother could muster up, she retrieved the paddle. It was an oak paddle designed to stir applesauce. And it was designed to stir applesauce, but that day it stirred my soul. It was about 18 inches long carved out of a piece of oak. It had a round handle about an inch and a quarter in diameter and six inches long. The other 12 inches was the blade on that thing. Two and a half inches wide, half inch thick. Maybe I shouldn't have used the word blade, but I don't think I would have been more terrified if it had been a blade. She took me by the arm and marched me out the back door and up to the old wash house. Every farm back then had a wash house. And back then, the wash house was where you did the laundry. In addition to processing meat when you butchered, there were two brick furnaces with two butcher kettles that sat in the top to cook your meat. When you weren't butchering meat, you used the wash house as a laundry room. You'd heat your water in the butcher kettle. You had to build a fire under the kettle to heat the water that then was placed in the old ringer washer, sitting there in the middle of the wash house. Mother had an old wooden chair sitting beside uh, the old ringer washer. The back was broken off the chair, and it was gone, and on that chair she would place her galvanized wash tub that received the clothing as it came out of the ringer. I remember that ringer. I was helping send clothes through that thing one day, I got my fingers in it, and it started pulling me in. And Mother was right there and rescued me, released me from that ringer. But anyhow, Mother removed that old wash tub from that chair with the back broken off the chair, and she sat down. She reached out to me and laid me on the altar of her lap. I must have been as terrified as Isaac was when Abraham laid him on that altar. Tears were now streaming down her cheeks as she gave me that first swat of the paddle. Now for those of you who are concerned about child brutality here, she didn't beat me with that thing. She simply spanked me. It was a right good spanking, as the old timers would say, that I needed desperately. I didn't think so back then, but she probably was saving my soul from a burning hell. Now back to the first crack of that paddle. I remember screaming. I screamed out, Mother, you're going to kill me. I was scared. With tears streaming down her face, she 
replied, this hurts me much more than it's hurting you. A lot of you kids have heard that over the years. But what I didn't understand was the difference between physical pain and emotional pain. Now, when I screamed, Mother, you're going to kill me, my three sisters were outside. They were just little girls. I was just a little boy. They were outside that old wash house, just shaking in their shoes, thinking that Mother was really killing me. They told me so after the incident was over. They were so scared. And I'd like to put in here that um, they were scared. And they were scared for their little brother. And my sisters loved me dearly. They have said since that time between mother and them that they spoiled me rotten. And I think they probably did. They loved me dearly, and they took really good care of me. They watched over me. I was just a little guy. I had two older sisters and one younger sister. They told me after the incident was over, and that severe spanking must have helped me because years later, my mother said that I, Harold Wilderson, turned into the nicest little boy you could ever imagine. From that point on, I don't think there was any backtalk left in any of us four kids. I think I was the one who had to pay the price, though, for all four of us to help us realize that disobedience brings pain. And I'd like to talk a little bit about disobedience bringing pain. I'd like to fast forward to 1989. Our oldest son was 10 years old, and he decided that he wanted a motorcycle. Now, when you're 10 years old, it's time to start thinking of a motorcycle. <laughs> For him, it was, it was a, his heart's desire. And so he had saved up his money and bought a fairly new Honda Trail 90 motorcycle. It had a transmission with a low range, and a high range. A, there was a grassy farm lane that went about a half a mile from the road to the back of the farm where he could ride. A Trail 90 had the gas tank under the seat instead of between your legs, like most motorcycles. So being only 10 years old, he would go up to the motorcycle, which was leaning towards him on its kickstand, stand it up off the stand, and balancing it while giving the kickstand a kick to the right. That's why it's called a kickstand. You kick it. And then you stand there balancing the motorcycle. And then you step through the bike. Where most motorcycles have a gas tank. He stepped through with his right leg in front of the seat. All the while balancing the bike to keep it from falling on him. The bike was way more in size than he was, but he did this, it seemed, with ease. So while holding the bike up and balancing it to keep it from falling on him, he used his left hand to reach down and turn on the key. Then while balancing the bike, he used his right hand to flip out the kickstart foot pedal, jump up and come down on the kickstarter with his right foot. I remember as a boy, the old Harley riders would do just that on a big Harley, they would actually jump up in the air and come down on that kickstand with all 250 pounds, which a lot of them weighed, uh, on that Harley to get it started. You'd always have to turn the choke on for the first kick. And then you'd turn the choke off and then jump up and come down on that kickstand again, which is when it would start. He did all this while keeping it balanced and not falling over on him. Then he'd use his left foot to push the shift pedal into first gear. Then jump up onto the seat, give her the gun, and take off. Wow, what a thrill. He loved that bike. By the way, Brent was instructed to never put the bike in high range. He's 10 years old. Don't put it in high range. There's a small lever on the side of the transmission where you could switch into high range from low range. He was just a little guy, but how he could ride that thing. 
Some weeks later, my wife Karen was helping Brent get ready for bed when she noticed some severe brush burns on his back and a nasty gash on his elbow. That's when he started one of his first major confessions as a young boy. He said, Mom, do you remember teaching me that disobedience brings pain? And I'd just like to say he still carries those scars on his body to remind him of just that. Do you remember, do you remember teaching me that disobedience brings pain? She's like, yes, I remember. Brent said, remember that you and Dad told me to never change the bike into high range. My wife says, yes, what happened? Well, I put the bike in high range and was cruising back the lane. I was going pretty fast when I hit something. I don't know what to this day, what it was, but I was thrown from the bike. That's why I have all these cuts and bruises. And I'd like to say I think his angels were busy watching over him that day, big time. They were really on the job. He could have been very easily killed at the speed he was going. But he learned the hard way that disobedience brings pain. Now he's teaching his own five children that disobedience does bring pain. Back now to my own early lesson in life about disobedience bringing pain. I was at the ripe old age of seven when I learned my lesson about disobedience. I needed to give my heart to Jesus. I was under conviction, but I just couldn't do it. As I had said, when I was a little boy, our church would have revival meetings. It was usually in the fall or in the early winter. And uh, this was a time when you could give your heart to Jesus. Uh, it's just how we did it at our church. We'd have revival meeting and you could give your heart to Jesus during that time when they gave an invitation at the end of the service. I remember one cold Saturday night when the invitation was given, I, Harold Wilderson, stood to my feet. And right then and there, I gave my little heart to Jesus. I stood there shaking in my shoes. You didn't go to the altar back then. You just stood to be recognized. The preacher saw me, and I still remember him. He's gone now, bless his heart. His name was Henry Huntsberger. Some of you may know him. A very uh, wonderful, talented speaker. He had, uh, and he's gone now, but I was talking to some of his family just a few days ago and sharing with them this story of how I gave my heart to Jesus as he ministered that Saturday night at the church where I attended. So that he saw me, Henry saw me standing there. He raised his hand high in the air as he looked right at me. That meant, I see you standing as you're, you're giving your heart to Jesus. I see you standing, and I know you're giving your heart to Jesus. And at that point, you could sit down as the angels rejoiced over another lost soul being ushered into the kingdom. Oh, what an experience to have that load of sinfulness lifted off of me. Here I was. My sins were all forgiven. I'd after, I had, after all these years, stood for my Jesus. Well, that was all well and good, but the job wasn't finished yet. You see, the church that I went to took the verse... Um, in Mark 16, 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. They took that to mean that it needs to be done now. But he that believeth not shall be condemned, or King James says damned. It was very important to get baptized immediately because if you were killed in a car accident or any other way before you were baptized, then you're going straight to hell. You went straight to hell. You did not pass go. You did not collect $200 for passing go, as in the game of Monopoly, when you were sent to jail. You were going straight to hell. If that happened, if that happened, if you had an accident and were killed before you were baptized, that's what I want to say. So it was very important to get baptized now. So the next morning, which was Sunday, we had church. And after church, we headed for the first spring house 
on the Falling Spring stream there in our local area. We all gathered there as a group, lots of believers, some unbelievers, and when it was my turn, I was led down the steps to the water where I was to be baptized. It was probably three feet deep there. And if you remember me saying I was shaking in my shoes as I stood and gave my heart to Jesus, I remember shaking all over more than anywhere else. My whole body was shaking as I went down into that water. You could barely breathe because you, you, were, you were just shaking and hard to breathe and cold. It was the coldest thing I ever experienced in my life. This was in the middle of December, 1960. I remember it was 1960 because my mom took my Bible and in one of the first pages in the Bible, a blank page, she wrote in there, Harold gave his heart to the Lord, to Jesus. Harold gave his heart to Jesus. Well, December, uh, right now, it's not coming to me, the actual date, but December 1960. She wrote it in my Bible, so I would never forget. They dipped me three times forward. In the name of the Father, the second time down was in the name of the Son, and the third time under was in the name of the Holy Ghost. The minister would then put his hands on your head and pray a beautiful prayer over you. That's when you were officially saved. I remember coming up those steps just shaking uncontrollably. When I got to the top of the steps, I was greeted by several deacon's wives who wrapped me in towels and blankets. It felt like I had died and gone straight to heaven. It felt so good. Wow, I, I felt like a hundred tons of weight was lifted off of me. I was now saved. I was raised up into new life. That was my new beginning. I was so excited. I wanted everybody to get saved too. Everybody else needed to be saved. I was so excited. I was nine years old. I was just the happiest little boy you could ever imagine. I wasn't perfect, but I was saved. I was forgiven. Jesus was just what I needed. I tell you this story so that you don't have to go through the torture that I went through as I resisted the greatest gift that God could ever give, ever. Oh, the joy of serving Jesus. Oh, the love I felt in my heart and the peace was indescribable. Up until I gave my heart to Jesus, I remember dreaming of dying and going to hell. I actually had dreams where I went to hell in my dream. Waking up from those nightmares, my heart pounding, getting out of bed, my knees hitting the floor, and pleading with God to help me. I remember after I was saved, the dreams were different. I could take you today to the very spot where I was standing in my dream at the old home place when the rapture happened. I remember shooting straight up off the earth. The G-force was so great as I lifted off. It felt like all my guts went straight down and wrapped around my pelvis. It was actually painful in my dream. But it was the greatest feeling of pain ever. If you've ever had pain, it felt good. It was, a, it was terrible pain, but it felt so good as I lifted off. I woke up from that most wonderful dream the most wonderful dream I'd ever had in my life. I lay there in bed so happy to have seen a small glimpse of things to come. And I'm looking forward to the rapture. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. My God, you said in your word, delight yourself also in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. So, Lord, you know my deepest heart's desire is that all would receive you as their Savior, Lord, Master, Healer, Comforter, and soon coming King. May those listening today receive you and then bring their brothers and sisters aunties, uncles, cousins, grandpas, and grandmas, 
and all their friends into the kingdom. That by their lives and by their testimonies and the blood of the Lamb and being filled with your Holy Spirit, bring all their offspring down to 10,000 generations. And I use 10,000 generations, dear loved ones, because I didn't want to miss anybody. We don't know when the rapture is going to happen. It might be 10 generations till it happens. But I didn't stop there. I said down to 10,000 generations or more into your kingdom, Lord. That's my heart's desire. Oh, Lord, that there would be an exponential growth in your kingdom. Our desire is that not one perish. We love you. We adore you. We praise you. We worship you. For you are worthy. In Jesus' holy name, amen. God bless you all. I love each one of you. Please receive Jesus into your heart. It's a most important decision you will ever make in your life. And it's so important that you do it and do it now. Jesus could return any moment. I remember reading about the disciples. They thought he was going to return in their lifetimes. That's been 2,000 years ago. He hasn't returned yet, but he can still return. And he'll come in the twinkling of an eye. I remember coming home from school as a little boy before I gave my heart to Jesus. And my mother was usually there to serve me some, maybe some cookies and a glass of milk. And I came in the front door and I called out to my mother. We had to call her mother, by the way. She told us at a very young age that you're not going to call me mom. You're not going to call your daddy dad or pop. She had to call her parents mom and pop. We were to call them mother and daddy. I cried out for my mother. I didn't see her anywhere. She didn't answer. Nobody was around. And I knew about the rapture, and I thought it had just happened. So I, it was a while before I found her, and I was so relieved. I remember reading about a young youth pastor. He kept falling asleep at their weekly get-togethers as a church uh, team. He was so tired, constantly tired from running hard. And he would fall sound asleep during their, their meetings. So they all got together and decided they're going to play a trick on him. So that day, they all brought a full change of clothes, shoes, uh, the whole works. And after he fell asleep, they all got up put all their clothing, had some of it strewn around on the floor, their shoes and everything were there, all scattered around, some of it hanging over the chairs that they were sitting in, some of it on the floor, and they went out. And I like to embellish a good story. <laughs> I have a feeling they had a, they had a video running somewhere. They had to. And uh, the look on his face when he woke up and everybody was gone. Clothes strewn around on the floor. I don't know the rest of the story. Someday maybe I'll hear the rest of the story, but that it makes for a really good story. The point being, we need to be ready. For in any moment, the trumpet will sound, and we're going to leave the ground, and we're going to be caught up together with Jesus in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. So grateful that we could be together today, and I could share this with you. And hopefully, I've planted a seed in your hearts. And maybe, maybe you won't um, receive Jesus now, but maybe somewhere along the line, somebody will water that seed that we planted today. I say we because I ain't doing this on my own. Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branch. If you abide in me and I abide in you, you'll bear much fruit. And then he said, without you, I can do nothing. So when I pray to Jesus, I say, Lord Jesus, I pray to God in Jesus' name. And I say this in my prayer. I say, Lord Jesus, you're the vine and I'm a branch. And as, you, as I abide in you, Jesus was the word. And St. John chapter 1 says in the word was with God and the word was God. 
And then later on in that chapter, it says, and the word came and dwelt among men. And so as we abide in Jesus, who is the word, and he abides in us, which he does, we as Christians have Jesus right here in our hearts, in this temple of the Holy Spirit. We can go out and we can sow seeds. I might have told this story before, but it's a story that I just love to tell. It was so real. I was, kind of, I was the idea of planting seeds. I was coming out of Chambersburg going east on Route 30. I came to Stouffer Avenue. The light was red and I slowed down. There was a couple of cars ahead of me. As I stopped, right seconds before I came to a stop, I was kind of in the spirit. I was kind of just there with the Lord. It was just he and me. And I said to him, and I didn't know I was going to say this two seconds before I said it. I said, Lord, just let me glow right now. I just want to glow. And that's all I said. My car came to a stop. To my left, in the other lane next to me, Pennsylvania State Highway Control Cruiser pulled up beside me. And right beside me, in the passenger seat, was a Pennsylvania State Policeman. I turned to my left and looked at him, and at the same time, he looked at me. I'll never forget it. I'm looking forward to meeting him in heaven someday. I'll never forget it. He looked at me and his eyes got big. His jaw kind of dropped down. He took his elbow and nudged his, the driver, the trooper that was driving. And he turned and looked at me. His eyes got big and his jaw dropped down. And I just, I was just overwhelmed. The light changed and off we went. And that was the last I saw. Him. But what I did, I said, Lord, I want to claim those two guys for you. They need Jesus if they don't already have him in their heart. They saw something, and they knew something was going on, and I think they knew what, would it, what it was. I think they knew that it was Jesus glowing through me. It was the glory of the Lord just glowing. And so, and so I said, Lord, I, I'm claiming their souls for you. I'm claiming that this little seed that was sown right here, right now, that it will go and germinate and somebody will water it and somebody will harvest and Lord I'm praying that they'll share the good news that they heard from that seed that was planted and from those who watered it those who helped harvest that seed that plant that grew up that soul that was saved and that they those two policemen would go out and tell their brothers and sisters, their aunties and their uncles and their cousins and their grandmas and their grandpas, that Jesus is the way. And that they would tell the story of Jesus. And that they would love telling the story. That's what we're talking about here today. Get yourself saved. Go out and tell that story. And that through their lives and their testimonies and the blood of the Lamb, that many would come into the kingdom. There would be great exponential growth in the kingdom and that's how i pray for people when i pray for them i might just pass them on the street walking down the street they might pull out in front of me as i'm going down the highway and i have to slow down there was a time where i was really upset when somebody would do that to me and then I, until i realized that uh maybe the angel of the lord had something to do with this if he hadn't pulled out in front of me i'd have gotten to maybe a scene of an accident that I would have been involved in had I not been deter deter yeah, deterred, I think that's the word I would say, uh, for maybe a half a minute or a minute. And so it's time for us to plant seeds. It's time for us to tell the story. It's time to us for us to bring down the glory all over the world and that people would praise the Lord and worship him and rejoice over what he's done for each one of us. And may we all simply just give our hearts to Jesus. It's not that hard to do. He'll help you. He'll bring love into your heart. He'll heal you. 
You see, when Jesus died on the cross, we all know about the cross. Some of us don't know about what happened to Jesus before he was nailed to that old rugged cross. They took him and they tied him up to a whipping post. They took his clothes, his robe off. He was there naked and they started whipping him with a cat of nine tails. Those big Roman soldiers. I don't know if you look it up in Siri, she'll tell you what it is. It's nine strips of leather fastened to a wooden handle. And on the end of those strips of leather were pieces of sharp objects like pieces of metal, maybe glass. I don't know if they had glass back then, but whatever it was that was sharp, they would fasten them to the ends of that leather strip and they would beat their prisoners to a pulp. And they beat him. And when that cat of nine tails came down across their back, they drug it down across the back as they swatted their prisoner. And it would rip their back into shreds. While they were doing that, they were cursing him. They were mocking him. They were spitting on him. They went ahead and plucked his beard out. I know what it feels like to just pluck one hair out of my beard. They were plucking his beard out, old fistfuls of his beard, just ripping his face to shreds. They said that even his close friends didn't recognize him. He was so bloodied up. And then at some point, they put that old crown of thorns on his head, and they nailed him to that old rugged cross. But that beating that he took was for your healing. You need to receive Jesus as your Savior, and right along with that, you receive healing for your body, for your spirit, for your emotions, for your finances, every part of you, for your relationships. Jesus took that beating for your healing. I've heard people say, well, that was just spiritual healing. No, I think when God does something, he does it 100%. When he heals you, you're completely healed. Every day, I thank Jesus. Sometimes I hurt. The first thing I do when I feel pain is say, Lord, I thank you that I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus and I'm living in divine health. For it is written, and by his stripes, he were healed. And I re I'm reminded of an old black brother. We were talking about black singers today, and I appreciate every one of them. Some of them are really some super singers, and I don't want to start mentioning names. You might know some of them. But I remember that um, this black brother, he was a pastor. And it was Easter Sunday morning, and they were talking about the crucifixion. And they were talking about the stripes that Jesus received across his back. And he was talking about the fact that by those stripes, you were healed. I love how he told his story because he, a four-year-old child could understand how he told his story. He said, Jesus took those stripes. He went through all the suffering that Jesus received when he took those stripes. And he said, in Isaiah, it says, and by his stripes ye were healed. I just love this guy. He said, now if you were healed, that means you are healed. I can't wait to give him a big hug when I get to heaven because of the next thing he said, and only he could say it this way. He said, now if you are healed, you were healed, that means you are healed. And if you are healed, that means you is healed. And it's like, there's no doubt in my mind that I'm healed. And we just need to receive it as born again believers. We need to receive his healing that came from those stripes before he was nailed to that old rugged cross. There's so many wonderful things I'd love to tell you about living for Jesus. And I'd love to just tell you the stories. I don't know if I'm a preacher, but I love, I love a good story. Jesus told stories when he was here on the earth. He was one of the greatest uh, illustrators. He always illustrated his stories, his, his thoughts with stories. He talked about farmers going out to sow seed and some fell among thorns, some fell among the rocks, and some fell on good ground. I've been a farmer all my life, and I was blessed to be able to plant seeds over the years in really good ground. We 
live on a farm in the little village of Duffield, Pennsylvania. And Duffield has some of the richest soil in the United States. If you look on the soil maps of Pennsylvania, you'll see little plots of Duffield soil on these soil maps, maps that the Conservation Service puts, puts out. I remember going down into our meadow. Now, a lot of topsoil had kind of filtered in our meadow from off the hills around us. But we were digging uh, test holes for a septic system we wanted to put in, drain lines. They were down seven feet in black topsoil. And they still hadn't hit subsoil yet at that point. The whole farm doesn't have seven feet of topsoil. But the stuff just grows. And it said some fell among, some of those seeds, Jesus said, fell among, fell on good soil and brought a hundredfold return. And we've seen that out there on the farm. And Jesus, when they designed, when he and his father and the Holy Spirit designed our world that we live in, he designed everything to replace itself if anything happens to it. He designed exponential growth. You plant a seed of corn, you get an ear of corn, maybe two ears of corn. So I've seen three ears of corn on a stalk of corn, and you get hundreds of seeds back from that one little seed that you planted. He said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish your earth. He wants the earth replenished with people that love him, who want to praise him and worship him. And he didn't tell us that if he thought for a minute that there wouldn't be enough food to go around if we did just that. Because everything he designed was exponential growth, exponential food, more food than you can imagine. Jesus is not, God is not uh, a God of shortages. There's no shortage on God's mercy. There's no shortage on God's love. There's no shortage on his provisions for us as his, his dear children. I see my time is about up. I just want you to know that you need to receive Jesus. I plead with you. Receive Jesus as your Savior. Go ahead and let him fill you up with the Holy Spirit and go out there and by your life and by your testimony and by the blood of the Lamb bring souls into the kingdom that we can all gather together one day and enjoy the joys of the Lord together. I love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen.